strap yourself in for a wild ride because this is the big spoiler video for the latest Siege of Terror book, Echoes of Eternity. Enjoy the footage in the background. It's Eternal Crusade. It's old footage because I know people always ask me about that. I'm just going to put it in there to keep you entertained. I'm going to go through everything in the book, all the big story points that I remember, uh, the things that got me excited. Just basically a spoiler summary of what happened in this book. If you don't want to be spoiled, then please leave the video right now. It's your first and only warning. If you want to go and get the book, then guess what? It's out right now. You can get it on Audible. You can get it on um, ebook. You can get it in hardback. It's out there. Go and get it. Go read it and then come back to this video if you want. Right, let's jump in and let's get talking. So for me, this book really showed off the grim darkness of what was going on during the siege in the other books we've seen the fighting but we haven't really seen like the consequences of that fight and in this one we do like we open up and like terror is basically a dead world it's just clouded with dust rubble it's just an absolute wasteland like humanity is dying upon the planet because of what's happening with the siege you know constant bombardments titan wars astartes for the Astartes. it's an absolute wasteland of just death and destruction now the main characters of course in this book are sanguinius because sanguinius does the, the whole eternity gate but amit has a fantastic story in this book lotara sarin makes an appearance and she has um, a nice story in this book and um, you have woody is in this book you have ark and land which is a fantastic story and um, you have zephon uh, back from the dead which we'll get into in a second all these little stories add to the book and they all come to the conclusion right at the end End for this epic epic battle where the traitors launch their big attack on the last wall or the last defenses and of course on the eternity gate one of the great insights to this book is sanguinius and the revenants now the revenants are the blood angels chapter before they become the blood angels we actually have a scene where the emperor himself finds sanguinius which again i love these little insights when the emperor meets his sons for the first time like the emperor um uh, basically met sanguinius like on like a dusty plane it was just like sanguinius sanguinius didn't bring an army or anything with him he basically went out and met the emperor um he saw like the custodians around him the emperor come out of his ship and the emperor was like walking around sanguinius um, looking at him like looking at his wings and stuff and sanguinius could kind of sense the thoughts of the emperor like son weapon you know uh, general that kind of thing and they have like this great little talk back and forth and sanguinius basically says listen i will be loyal to you i will serve you but you have to make me the oath the promise that you will new you won't touch basically the people that I guard because the people see Sanguinius kind of as like a god um, on the planet of Baal. And he basically says to the Emperor, I'll serve you, but you will not touch these people. Um, they'll make their own mind whether to join me or not. And the Emperor basically agrees. He says, Okay, then let's do it that way. The Revenant storyline is fantastic as well because we get to see more insight into a Legion before it actually became the Blood Angel Legion. Um, Amit is the main star of this. We get to see him uh, being turned into um, a Space Marine all the way to where he is at the end of uh, the Battle of the Eternity Gate and who he fights and stuff. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, we get to learn some customs of the actual Revenants as well. Um, basically, they used to eat the flesh of their fallen um, so they could remember them and, you know, have a bit of their life and it carried on within them which i thought was really really cool but the thing is that we learned is that the revenant legion um was kind of looked down upon no one wanted to work with them they're not like the blood angels of now where they're like these noble glorious warriors that you know people want to serve with people want to you know fight with um they were kind of cast aside uh they were basically split up into like big groups because um having them as one legion is kind of not a good thing so um yeah they were basically cast aside and uh, no one wanted to work with them um they were kind of like outcasts in a way because of their of their way of warfare how brutal um they were they were they were so brutal uh, at one stage uh, like a, a group of them were working with dawn and dawn basically gave him a talking to he talked down to them and um, he erased their 
uh, their battle of the planet where they took the planet just because how brutal they were because it was just it was just not something that the Imperium should be which again I thought is funny because the way the Imperium is now and how brutal they are. We learned that Sanguinius actually didn't go to his legion straight away um, because as I mentioned the Reverence were all split up around the galaxy it took years and years for them to actually come together as a legion again so while Sanguinius was waiting for that to happen he was serving with the um, Sons of Horus, aka the Lunar Wolves, and um, that's where he was learning everything from. Uh, you know, uh, the Lunar Wolves love Sanguinius, Horus loves Sanguinius. Um, there's a really great scene when Sanguinius is actually meeting his legion for the first time, and he's actually being escorted by Abaddon and stuff like that, and they're all having a joke on the ship saying, Have you prepared a speech? Uh, Primark and the you know the little jokes and it's 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 a great little scene and we all know that it turns to crap of course because you know Abaddon and everyone who sides with Horus and what it goes like it's a, it's a kind of a sad thing as well but Sanguinius meets his legion and he's like you know I'm your father but you know I don't want to take over straight away I want to serve with you um if you accept me then I will lead you if you don't then basically I will go back to Baal that's what he says I will go back to Baal if you don't want to serve with me. But of course, we all know Sanguinius rises and he becomes what he becomes. Now, as I mentioned, Amit has a really, really big story in this book, but it's kind of intertwined with another character called Kargos. Now, Kargos is a world eater apothecary, but at this stage during the siege, the nails are really biting into his head. We actually learn that it's Kargos that finds Khan on the battlefield and he sees Khan's body like kneeling, like the way it's left. He He's kneeling on the battlefield and he's like, this is no way for like a champion to die. And um, he actually drags Khan's axe and puts it back in his hand because he's like, a warrior should always die um, with a weapon in his hand before the other world eaters find him and start basically taking the mickey out of him. Um, then Kargos actually takes Khan's axe and he's the one who starts using the axe then um, going forward actually at the siege. But what we learn about Kargos is that Kargos is actually a chain brother. This is what it's called, a chain brother with Amit, because Amit served with the World Eaters, and he basically you know, got some of their customs, just like Sigismund, really, where he learned to fight in the pits, and Kargos and Amit were chain brothers, where they basically were chained to themselves, and they fought um, against other chain brothers, and that bond is like a really, really big bond um, in the books. Like, you know, you always trust your chain brother, um, you hide no secrets from them, etc., etc. We actually have something where Amit and Kargos um, fight for their lives um, in the cages um, against another pairing of chain brothers and they become out victorious. This is actually in front of Sanguinius and Angron um, because it's like this big politic thing that happens with, with, with the other thing because Kargos kills another world eater and, you know, it, he gets challenged by the, the other world eater's friends and Amit comes to his side and helps him. But what we learn, of course, is that Kargos then um, actually fights Amit um, on Terror. Uh, they actually meet each other on Terror, and this is absolutely fantastic scene. I'm not doing it justice here, but Amit basically just beast Kargos, and the word he says to him, and I'm sorry, YouTube, he, he just comes in and goes, eat shit, traitor, and then he cuts Kargos's throat, and it's absolutely, it's, it's, just, it's just the way that the whole scene is framed, and when I was listening to the audiobook, how like the voice actor did it, it's just absolutely perfection. Now, one of the big talking points of this book is that Zephon was going to return. Now, Zephon is a blood angel who was basically introduced in a book called Master of Mankind. He was a blood angel that was sent back to Terra because he like lost his like legs and he was given bionics and they didn't work properly, so he couldn't perform in the field. So um, he basically met this character called Arkenland. Arkenland is the chap who then went on to make the um, Land Raiders and stuff like that. You know, that's what he's famous for. Um, well, he's already made him at this point, but he's, he, he's, he's known to be one of the greatest acolytes and stuff like that. He's actually work with the emperor and stuff um but about zephon zephon basically died in the last book but we learn about this book is that he didn't really die he went to like a comatose state his body kind of shut down as space marines do uh, to try and you know save themselves and he was brought back to life um with the assistance of ark and land and uh, him and ark and land meet up and they have this whole little adventure 
um, through the book, you know, um, actually getting back to the defences and meeting up with Sanguinius and the rest of the Blood Angels. Um, they have this absolutely fantastic scene um, where when the traitors are launching their final attack, um, Ark and Land is absolutely scared out of his mind. And Zephon's like, if you run away, if you run away and leave like my acolytes who have basically, you know, are so attached to Zephon because they're the people who put his armor on and stuff like that. I will find you, Arkham Land, and I will absolutely murder you, okay? You stand here and you make an oath, and Arkham Land's like, okay, I will do it, I'll do this. By the way, Arkham Land has this monker, um, which I absolutely love. I've always loved it since it got introduced in the books. Um, and I have to say, Aaron, why did you do this? The monkey dies, right? The monkey, I can confirm the monkey dies. The monkey dies actually saving Ark and Land from a word bearer. And it was one of the most brutal scenes in the entire book. I actually had to pause my audiobook and go make myself a drink and just walk around the house a bit. You know, just like when you do and when you, you stand there just looking at certain things, thinking, what's just happened? Um, I had to do that. The monkey dying was probably one of the most heartbreaking things in this book, especially when Zephon comes and rescues Ark and Land, and Ark and Land turns around and says, Zephon, they killed my monkey. And I'm like, God damn it, they really did. They killed the monkey. Why did you do this? Um, yeah, it was absolutely brutal. Now, with the final battle, the way this is written, I personally think is fantastic because you get to see the Imperial side, and then you get to see the uh, traitor side of it. Now, the Imperium is gathering, it's gathering all of its forces. This is it. This is the final stand. Once this breaks, they are into the inner, uh, inner core of the palace, and it's basically the Emperor's dead, and that is it. Um, Horus has won. And what we get, we get Sanguinius give this massive, massive speech saying, listen, I know that most of you are scared because don't forget this you know there's imperial guard um it's not just space marines on the wall and sanguinius says if you want to run then run right now just go just leave now but if you stand then you will stand and stuff and it's you know it's a great speech and everyone just just to stands as like, yeah, we'll stand for the Emperor, that kind of thing. Um, but we see the flip side of this when the traitors actually charge the wall and um, all the guns open up. And you have like these great scenes where it goes through certain traitors, like there's an Imperial Guard traitor, um, like where he, where she's been. Um, she signed up with her brother for the War Master and stuff. And then all of a sudden it's ended because a shell hits into her tank and explodes and kills everyone in there. Uh, you see it with um, like a, a, a Night Lord. I think it is like he's jumping through the skies he's very nimble and stuff but you know he's just taken out by a last cannon like all these characters who've come to this point they've been fighting for how long they've been fighting for um endless kills and they're taken out in a blink of the eye because the bombardment of the loyalists are just absolutely ripping into them but just because you have just the sheer mass of traitors the hordes of the traitors these titans is everything um of course they managed to reach the defenses and this is where we have the big final battle of course this is where carbanda shows up carbanda has been given the task by corn to redeem himself to kill 500 blood angels carbanda's like i can do that i can do that in an hour but Korn says, no, you have to do it, basically, while Sanguinius is watching. So you kind of have this, like, mini chase scene where Carbanda is trying to kill Blood Angels, but Sanguinius keeps gripping him and keeps beating the balls out of him. And then, of course, we all know that Sanguinius ends up defeating Carbanda. Um, he's exhausted. As soon as he defeats Carbanda, this meteorite of fire crashes into the ground, screaming, Sanguinius! And, of course, um, that is um, um, Angron. Angron in his demon form. He's fighting uh, Sanguinius. I covered this more in my video the previous day. Go and watch that. Um, it's, again, it's, it's one of these absolute epic battles in this book sanguinius gets stabbed in the belly by um uh, uh, angron's sword and um, that makes he can get close to um angron and he ends up ripping the nails out of angron's head and uh, you kind of feel like this it's like a laugh from corn himself because corn doesn't care that angron is about to be banished he's about to be, be defeated because corn doesn't care where the blood flows from just as long as as the blood flows you know it's it's corn at the end of the day now while all this is going on on the outside world on the services terror we actually get another primark duel and it's vulcan versus magnus yes um magnus basically is looking uh, for his way towards um 
the golden throne. If he finds it, he can eliminate it, and then the demons can pour through. So basically, Vulcan is given the task um, to go into the webway and try and find Magnus and basically stop him. And it's a great, it's 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 actually a great duel to be fair because Vulcan can't die. We all know this. Vulcan is perpetual, so Magnus is constantly killing Vulcan. Vulcan's trying to talk to magnus to show him his ways and um we get like a full like slate of like magnus killing vulcan in different ways like he seals his mouth so he can't breathe and he chokes to death um you know he burns him you know he, 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 there's, there's so many ways vulcan dies but every time he keeps coming back um and magnus you know is getting tired um vulcan basically calls out magnus and says, you did do something wrong, Magnus. It's kind of, at this point, I would call a meme, because we all know, like, we have these conversations on Reddit, on on uh, the forums and stuff, everywhere where we talk about stuff like that. Uh, was Magnus wrong? Magnus did nothing wrong and stuff like that. Um, eventually, um, you know, Mag Magnus does meet the end, because um, Vulcan basically rams his hammer through Magnus's skull, Um Magnus um then of course he's banished um Vulcan has won but before he he dies uh, Magnus basically atomizes and that's that's the way I saw this atomizes Vulcan and at this point I was like oh my god is he actually killed Vulcan like because he goes into like his actual DNA his actual design of him and rips him apart that way I'm like oh maybe this is how Vulcan actually does kind of like die and he can't become back as a perpetual anymore and um, but of course if you've read the beast arises series you know vulcan is actually um in that as well um but at the end of it we actually see like this this husk of a, a being dragging a hammer back towards like the path to the golden throne kind of thing so it's confirmed that vulcan of course does live and he's making his way back but that more or less says that he's not going to be part of the final assault on Horace's ship. Now back to like the battle on the outside. Of course, that's raging. Um, Sanguinius has killed Carbanda. Or I should say he's banished Carbanda. He's banished Angron. And um, there's a really cool scene where some of the traitor titans try to hold open the Eternity Gates because the Eternity Gates are closing and they launch their claws at it to really try and like rip it open. But Sanguinius, after he's beat both of the, um, uh, well, I say both the traitor Primax and one's not traitor Primax, after he's beat Carbanda and Angron, you know, he cuts the chains and stuff and the Eternity Gates close. Um, one of the big stories in this book is Lotara Sarin. Now, at the start, we see what really is happening to the Conqueror, the ship. Like, the water supplies have turned to blood. Uh, she requests aid from Horus. She actually um, speaks to Horus and says, Horus, I need, you know, I need some supplies. Can we go down and resupply? You know, my ship is dying. The people on the ship are dying. Horus is like, you are not Lotara Sarin. And I was like, oh my god, Horus is tripping balls. You know, he's, he's, he's basically a... Uh, uh, you know, blinded by chaos. But what we actually learn at the end of the book that it's actually not Lotara Sarin. It's kind of um, a wraith conjured by the ship's spirit, if that makes sense. The real Lotara Sarin is is kind of alive. She's like intertwined into the Conqueror now on the command seat. That's the way I saw it. And this this thing who believes she's Lotara Sarin. Is not actually Lotara Sarin. And um, that's why Horace was saying, you are not Lotara Sarin. And I was like, oh my God, Horace was actually right. It's not Lotara Sarin. The real Lotara Sarin, or what is Lotara Sarin now, is actually whatever that is on the command throne. Now, at the end of the ship, the Conqueror actually comes under fire. It's like, bang, boom, bang, bang, bang. We're under fire. We're under fire. And they're like, what the hell? Where are we being fired from? And then we get this absolute lair absolutely badass message from the white scars Sh um shabin shaban is that what he's called shaban shaban khan um basically says um this is the white scars we now have uh the spaceport guns at the lion's gate operational uh like die traitors and the fleet becomes uh under attack by the lion's gate it's, it's great you know they've got full of control they fixed it all and they begin firing on the fleet um the conqueror like puts his shields up it's like you know break formation that kind of thing and like one of the serfs like um uh, the ventral spirit the shields are down the shields are down on the ventral spirit and that's kind of like where it ends for that and then we get a message 
we get a message come through from um, the Retribution fleet. Gilliman's fleet um, sends a message. And I'm going to read the message out in a second, what Gilliman sends. But um, Lotara Saren blocks a message from reaching the traitors on the surface. But basically, Gilliman is a week out. Within seven days, his fleet... His entire fleet of the of the Ultramarines, um, uh, Rusty's coming, the Lion's coming, they will be over the skies of terror, ready to bring vengeance and lift the siege. So this is the epilogue, and this is the last thing we get from the Echoes of Eternity. This is the message that Gilliman sends to his brothers upon the planet. It says, Sanguinius. What transpires on the surface of the throne world, I cannot say. What horrors you have endured, I cannot imagine. All I know for certain is this. I am mere days from the system's edge, and within a solar week, I will be in the skies above terror. With me, I bring the entire might of the 13th Legion, and I am not alone. Word has reached me from Russ and the Lion, at the vanguard of the six and the first. Our numbers are enough to cleanse the heavens and tear down the world from the arch traitor's grip. Hold on to hope, brother. That is all I ask. Can you give me that? Can you stand your ground for these last ultimate hours? Those elusive twins, victory and vengeance are coming. This war ends the moment I reach terror. Hold, in the name of the Emperor, and the Imperium we have built together. I will be with you soon. 